So you can start, Dr. Tu. Dr. Ojo, can you hear? Can you hear me? Dr. Ojo. His mic is still muted. Yes. yes. Recording in progress. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My colleagues. My name is Dr. Ebihiri Hart. I'll be taking the um recall question through for the WCB 2021 April. Okay. So there were two versions of the question, but I just decided to combine, combine both. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So the first can version- on slide, Can you put it on slideshow? Okay, I think it's on slide. I put it on slide. It's on slide show. It's on slide slide show. show. Oh, okay. okay, I was just in the margins, so I was thinking it's not. okay. Go ahead. Okay, so the first version says if a farmer was clearing his farm when he suddenly felt a sharp pain in his foot, he looked down and noticed bleeding. He then heard a sound in the bush. What is your diagnosis? While the second version says a young man presented with features of envenomation to the air and following a bite by a snake. What are the various types of envenomation? What are the complications? What is the pathophysiology of envenomation by the vipery day? How would you manage this patient? What are the types of antivenom, its complications, and how you would, and how would you give the test dose and the remaining dose? What are the types of snakes and the likely composition of their toxins? How will you address reaction to anti-snake venom if it occurs? Will you still give anti-snake venom despite an anaphylactic reaction? Tetanus prophylaxis as a treatment measure, what will you do first before vaccination? So my diagnosis is um, snake, bite, snake bite with possible envenomation. If, using, going by the two questions, the first just says the man had a snake bite with and looked down and saw blood oozing out of his foot. So with that alone, I may not be able to um, completely um, give a short diagnosis because it, it, can, it can just be from the fang mark, from the bite site which may be, be without envenomation. However, the diagnosis I'll go for is snake bites with likely um, envenomation, which may be local or systemic. Um, what are the various types of envenomation and what are the complications? So I think this question basically meant complications of snake bites. So I did it in both ways. The types of envenomation, we have the no envenomation. So literature calls it minimal envenomation or dry bite, where you have <laughs> local... Sorry? Okay, so where you have local okay. findings such as bruising, tenderness immediately adjacent to the bite site with absent laboratory abnormalities and systemic findings. For the mild envenomation, the patient has local damage extending several centimeters away from the bite site to a major joint. For example, if the bite is on the foot, the swelling can ex and the um, other local um, um, uh, other local symptoms may, 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 may spread to the ankle joint. Then in this mild envenomation, there's still there are still no laboratory abnormalities or systemic findings. For the moderate envenomation, you have non-threatening, non-life-threatening signs and symptoms of systemic envenomation, such as vomiting, hematotoxicity without massive bleeding. And then there may be local damage extending beyond two joints. While for severe envenomation, there's extensive local damage beyond two joints with or without systemic toxicity, such as the systemic, the, the life-threatening. Um, systemic toxicity here will include hypotension, airway narrowing, muscle paralysis, which can result in respiratory failure. So complication of snake bites will be musculoskeletal system. You have a local wound infection. You have local wound infection, especially from those who have um, necrotizing injuries, extensive necrosis, gangrene, limb loss, compartment syndrome. Then there's cardiovascular compromise, such as um, arrhythmias may ensue because of the effect of my, possible malotoxic effect of, his, of the snake bite. For the eyes, depending on if the patient is spat into the eyes, you can have the patient can have corneal damage with blindness, which may be permanent. Um, they can be decimated in the intravascular coagulopathy, paralysis of the respiratory muscles leading to respiratory failure, then anaph anaphylactic reaction from the treatment of the um, snake bite. Now, what is pathophysiology of envenomation by the peridae? 
So we know that envenomation is the introduction of venom into the body system of warm-blooded animals with manifestation of its effect on the body. Snake venoms are highly variable and complex mixtures of enzymes, low molecular weight um, polypeptides, glycoproteins with different toxins. So it's also described as a soup of antigens. So most of these repaired venoms have um, both vasculotoxic or hematoxic and then neurotoxic um, properties. So the, for the vasculotoxic properties, they have hemorrhagins, which are zinc metalloproteinases. Uh, and then they also have phospholipase A. This phospholipase A both act as a um, vasculotoxic and on this um, neuro neurologic part. However, for the vascular part, they both cause um, damage to the um, um, vascular wall and then even local tissue damage, which can now result in leakage of blood or proteinous rich fluid and then cause local swelling and then systemic bleeding. So depending on where this um, vascular injury occurs, if it's occurring in the pulmonary circulation, there can be pulmonary edema. It can, if it's occurring in the, on the, around the bite side, there can be local swelling, which may extend and result in compartment syndrome. While for the, um, the um, they can also be blistering at the site of the um, injury. Now for the, there's, there's also an entity called venom-induced consumption coagulopathy, where um, serine proteases, which are con content of the, anti of the venom itself, cause activation of the coagulation factors um, 9, 5, photrombin, fibrinogen, which become exhausted and can result in them disseminating the vascular coagulopathy with, with uncontrolled bleeding from various sites. It can be epistaxis, it can be bleeding from the wound site, it can, be um, it can also result in upper GI bleeding in some instances where there's, um, where there's already a predisposing factor in that patient. Now, from this bleeding, there can be resultant shock and pulmonary edema, like I mentioned, depending on the area. So for the Neurotoxic parts, there are group two phospholipase A2 that damage nerve endings. They cause initially, so they, they, they cause this damage, they cause the problem in three phases. Initially, there's weak inhibition of the acetylcholine re release. Then you have a prolonged phase of facilitated release and a phase of progressive decline of neurotransmission due to the necrotic degeneration of the presynaptic terminal, terminal. All these will result in muscle paralysis because um, acet you know, we know that um, acetylcholine series is, has to do with um, calcium. It's a calcium dependent um, enzyme, and then it helps in muscle contraction. So, re um, resultant muscle paralysis can occur. If it, so if it occurs in the airway, there can be respiratory um, um, failure. How will I manage these patients? Now, the principles I want to follow would include, um, of course, going by the multiple um, multidisciplinary approach involving the neurophrologist, cardiologist, hematologist, phys the um, physician, orthopedic surgeon as the case may be, um, carry out my ABC of resuscitation, take a focused history, examine the patient, commence antivenom administration, give an algestics when necessary, wound care, identify and manage complications, and then tetanus prophylaxis. So for the second patient, for the second question, it specified that how will you manage the patient in the, in the emergency or at the A and E? So I want to implement my ABC of resuscitation, I ensure the airway is patent, I remove every form of obstruction, assess if the patient will need um, um, intubation or mechanical ventilation. Then I also want to um, 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 assess for breathing. If he's breathing, commence, check this um, oxygen saturation, commence oxygen when necessary, maintain saturation above 94%, um, keep a close watch on the airway. For the circulation, I'll ensure I secure a wide bore um, IV site and initiate um, IV infusions. I want to restrict that. Um, in Restrict ability uh, um, uh, activity in the limb and immobilize the affected area. For the quick history to take is just to determine the type of snake which may help in the antivenom administration, determine its color, the pattern, assess for the timing of events from when the snake beat the patient to when um, symptoms ensued, assess for symptom systemic symptoms, syncope, difficulty, breathing, swallowing, or difficulty in swallowing. History of allergies to medication will also be um, sought out from this patient and history of comorbid conditions. So I want to examine the patient, look out for local and systemic envenomation, assess for, the neuro assess for neurologic dysfunction too, examine the patient thoroughly, look for multiple bite sites, which may, because the snake may not have bitten a, just a particular um, area, then measure and record the circumference of the bitten extremity every 15 minutes to monitor for increase. And I'll also mark the link to monitor um, progress. 
Investigations would include a 20 minute whole blood clotting time. This will be done immediately to look out for um, signs of um, systemic inflammation like coagulopathy. And I want to repeat, repeat every four to six hours. I'll do a quick full blood, full blood count assessing for the platelet count and other differentials. Looking at, I will also do a um, clotting profile, electrolyte urine and creatinine, urinalysis, urine micro microscopy. A chest radiograph may also be beneficial, especially if, the, if there's um, pulmonary involvement. And ECG will be beneficial because um, the, there's also myotoxic effects, and this can affect the heart muscles, resulting in arrhythmias. So ECG will be beneficial. A cranial CT scan may be beneficial to explore other possibilities too, and to look out for bleeding in the brain. Then um, compartmental pressures may be monitored if I have the wherewithal. However, I can also look out for signs of compartment syndrome, such as um, extreme pain, which is not commensurate with the patient's um, injury or complaints. And there can also be the, the, the pulse, the, the limb may be pulseless, it may be very painful, it may be pale. So these are signs that will tell that compartment syndrome may be ensuing. Then a plain radiograph of the limb may also be beneficial because some snakes can leave their um, fangs within the injury site. So for the antivenom administration, the dose will depend on the severity of envenomation. I've mentioned the various, um, so I'll, I'll classify the patient into the, into the various um, groups, mild, moderate, or severe, and treat accordingly. For mild envenomation, the patient will benefit from one to five, five vials of, and now this would, this um, dose of, of antivenom also depends on the manufacturer and the country where, um, where the snake, where the snakes are prominent. What I'm saying so is because in some countries you have different you have different protocols depending on the um, on the snake. So generally, it is said that patients who with mild envenomation will benefit from one to five vials of antivenom infusion in normal cell and about hundred mils over one to two hours at a rate of five mils per minute. For the moderate envenomation, five to ten vials of antivenom into normal cell in over one to two hours. Severe envenomation would be, would be 10 to 20 vials. There's also a school of thought that says for mild, you have you can the patient will benefit from less than four vials, for moderate, four to six, and for severe, more than seven. So, like I said, it depends on the um, protocol followed. Now, sensitivity testing is no more necessary. However, you may want to premedicate the, with adrenaline because of the possibilities of the side effects of the antivenom. So adrenaline steroids um, like IV hydrocortisone at 200 milligram start will be beneficial to the patient. Antihistamines may also be beneficial for patients who have ATOP and have um, previous um, allergy to equine products. So the anti-snake venom should be started as soon as possible. It is beneficial within 24 hours of um, snake bites, although, although it, should, it is said that from four hours, well, it is beneficial within 24 hours of um, snake bite. It should be given as long as there's evidence of systemic envenomation, especially coagulopathy, if coagulopathy persists, then maximum dose should be about 25 vials. However, there are indications to extend the, the anti-snake venom um, dosing, especially if after you've completed your, and the anti-snake venom and then the um, bedside 20 minutes clotting time is still um, deranged after one to two hours. So you may want to um, repeat the anti-venom or give additional doses. And then if there's a deteriorating neurotoxic or cardiovascular sign after one so hours of administra administering the anti-snake venom, you want to um, give additional doses. Now for other supportive care will be include blood transfusion, especially in those who have evidence of coagulopathy, they may benefit from fresh frozen plasma, filter concentrate as this case may be, especially in the setting of DIC. Volume expanders to, con to um, control hypotension and to trick shock. Patient may also benefit from ionotropes. Then tracheostomy may be beneficial if there's respiratory compromise. Mechanical ventilation may also be beneficial. You want to ensure your patient is fed through the NG tube to prevent um, aspiration in, in the settings of respiratory failure. Um, analgesics will be beneficial to those who are in severe pain. You want to avoid NSAIDs as, soon as, as much as uh, avoid NSAIDs because that can promote bleeding. Then mild sedation in those who are anxious and antibiotics where necessary. So not all snake bites will require antibiotics. Then eye care, if the patient has eye involvement, you want to irrigate the eye, do a slit lamp examination to look out for corneal ulceration or damage, then topical antibiotics and padding. If there's acute kidney injury, the patient may benefit, you treat accordingly, the patient may benefit from hemodialysis, then um, anticholinesterase may be beneficial for those who have neurotoxic symptoms. You want to give neostigmine at 0 0.02 milligram per kg. Patient may benefit from that using doing the tensilon test. Uh, wound debris more will be beneficial in those, especially those with necrotic um, um, wounds. Then fasciotomy for compartment syndrome. 
that is after administering the antivenom to see if there will be um oh uh, if if the symptoms would would abate. But if it doesn't, patient will benefit from fasciotomy. Then they can also the patient may also benefit from limb amputation if if all um therapy has failed. Now for patient can be discharged within 24 hours if an advice to return if there's any worsening of symptoms. It depends on the envenomation. So you assess the patient accordingly and decide on discharge. So symptom if, the, if you want to advise the patient that if there is any um if there are symptoms of um bleeding, pain, swelling of the bite site, even after discharge, they should be presented to the hospital because they may benefit from the antivenom. And you also want to look out for complications from the administration of the antivenom it's from ad and for the from the antivenom itself. You have Okay, I'll talk about that in the next question. Um, preventive therapy will include uh, advising patient education, advising them to wear protective boots, long clothing, do not startle or provoke a snake, avoid handling snakes as much as possible. If the snake, if the snake has not fled, it's important to stay away cautiously, avoid walking or putting hands in dark places. Um, the next question was, what are the types of an, um, anti venoms, anti-snake venoms, and how would you give the test dose and remaining dose? So, like I said, there are various countries have various antivenoms, but in Nigeria, we use the Echitab G because it's known that the, Echi the Echitab is the, the Nigerian Echis um, Ocelatus, is a viper, is in the Viparidae group, and it's, no, it's, it's said that the Viparidae are more common in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa and Nigeria, so these particular antivenoms were used, but commonly we use the polyvalent type or the, the trivalent antivenom. So it was um, produced against um, carpet vipers, spitting cobras, and um, the puffadas, which are the three most important snakes in sub-Saharan Africa. So you have the Echitab G, Echitab plus IC, Echitab plus ICP, Echitab Fab. Now the Crofab is used in countries again um, in countries like Canada and the US against um, the Crotalidae snakes. So com complications over the antivenom is said that complications are, can be seen in about 20% of patients. You have the early anaphylactic reaction, the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, IgE um, mediated. So with um, activation of the um, mass, cell, it causes mast cell degranulation and then release of its um, contents, which can result subsequently in urticaria, pruritus, bronchospasm, and geoedema. The um, patient can also have diarrhea, tachycardia, fever, hypotension, and this can be seen within three, three to three minutes to 60 minutes of administration of the antivenom. Now, late reactions would include serum sickness, like which is a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, may occur within five to 24 days of admission. So you, that's why you advise the patient to look out for those signs, um, fever, chills, um, itching. And this is an, an, an immune, antibody immune complex um, type of um, reaction. So the patients here have come down with more of um, AKI. So you want to look out for and counsel the patient on the signs of that and to present in time. So to address the reactions for the early um, infection, for the early complications, stop the infusion immediately, um, administer um, adrenaline at, um, so you advise not to give IM, um, IM, um, in, 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 IM medications to patients with um, snake bites because of the possibility of bleeding. So IV is a better route and you dilute in one in 10,000 dilution. You can give antihistamine like diphenylhydramine, then steroids such as IV hydrocortisone, and then observe for ablation of symptoms and restart, recommence the antivenom. But you may want to give it at a, you may want to further dilute the antivenom or give it at a slower rate. For the late um, complications, the patient will benefit from one to two milligram per kg oral prednisolone till all symptoms have been improved, followed by one to two weeks of taper. They may also benefit from um, histamines. Now, for those with renal compromise, they may benefit from hemodialysis, as the case may be. So the next question was, will you give, still give anti-snake venom despite an anaphylactic reaction? Yes, I will. However, I will further dilute the antivenom with larger volumes of saline. What are the types of snakes and the composition of their toxins? We have the viperidae. Examples are the pit viper, rattlesnakes, adder snakes, cotton mouth snakes, copper head snakes. They, ha they have cytotoxins, and the cytotoxins come in various names, cytotoxin I. You also have the, although viper viperidae is more hemo hemotoxin, containing the hemorrhagin. So you have um, hemo hemo hemotoxin, cytotoxin, then you know, there are also some um, neuro neurotoxin um, properties of the viperidae. For the elapidae, they are more of based, they are predominantly neurotoxic um, features. So they have the neurotoxin one. Examples of the elapidae are the cobras, the mambas, coral snakes, the Indian crates, India crates. 
um now for the um neurotoxic features they are as listed just for time sake they also have um, cytotoxic symptoms so because they they can cause um they can affect the cardiac muscles too and result in arrhythmias hypotension and ophthalmic symptoms especially when there is um um, um, I am um, spitting on the eyes. It can be carried to conjunctivitis, corneal abrasion, blindness. Now, the hydrophidae, um, the hydrophidae examples are hydrophis elegans, hydrophis donaldi. They are water snakes. They are predominantly myotoxic. So you have more of the myotoxins. They can cause trismus, deep painful muscle. They can cause renal um, compromise. For the columbridae, they have examples are the boom slang. The boom slang is um. Um, venomous. However, the python, the boar, and the anaconda are non-venomous and they are more constrictor snakes. The venomous snakes here cause them um, have hematotoxin, hematotoxic properties and myotoxic properties. The atraspidae are the boring as and stiletto um, snakes. So for the tetanus prophylaxis as a treatment measure, what will you do before vaccination? I want to ask the patient about immunization history before I go ahead to immunize or give a booster dose as necessary. Thank you for listening. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ibi, for a wonderful presentation. Okay, uh, we welcome comments, contributions. Um, Dr. Momodo said, uh, I had some add-ons to what you said. So, a low hematocrit usually occurs with blood loss. <clears throat> and um, while the higher than normal value may indicate no concentration from systemic plasma extravasation, Peripheral neutrophilic leukocytosis may represent a general inflammatory response and confirm systemic envenomation. Um, see, the severe thrombocytopenia contributes to bleeding diastasis, so it may indicate microangiopathic hemolysis when accompanied by schistocytes in the blood film and acute injury. So, uh, prothrombin. An activated partial thromboplastin time, D dimer, fibrinogen, and fibrin degradation products are more sensitive indicators of venom induced clotting disturbances. Blood urea, serum, creatinine, and electrolyte concentrations help screen and monitor acute kidney injury. Creatinine phosphate kinase levels above 10,000 units per liter indicates severe rhabdomyolysis. Unexplained hypoglycemia can be an important clue to acute hypopituitarism following snake envenomation. So that's just the add on from Dr. Momodu. Thank um, you. The others are uploading your presentation. So, any other contribution, any other comments? Before we move on, yeah, I think we have had. Uh, had speak by his recent previous presentation. Uh, yeah, previous uh, presentation. Uh, okay. 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 All right. Um, can you unshare your slides okay. so that uh, Ojo can while we wait for for the contributions? Thank you. Okay, Dr. Okori is asking, what did you see about doing an X-ray of the site of injury? Okay, so it's uh, what I saw was that it's beneficial. It may be beneficial in some situations where the patient, the snake, may leave its fang within the wound. So you will see the fang on on the radiograph, and it can be removed by the surgeons, or as the case may be. Okay. Uh... So Dr. Akira is asking, please, I was wondering if there is a place for vitamin K or tranexamic acid in management of bleeding from snake bites. Okay, so for standard protocols, those did not um, appear, but these are things that we practice because of the, um, now we know that vitamin K is beneficial against um, clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. And one of the coagulation factors here that are also affected is that factor 10. So it's been, it may be beneficial, but I don't know if tranexamic acid. We just practice it, but according to the books, I've not seen it being documented. That's why I didn't include it. Okay. Um, is Dr. doing class? Yes, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Good morning. 
So you still need help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I I would I thought I was able to join through my laptop already uh, initially, but I wasn't able to. The same meeting is uh, filled up. Okay. Um. Sorry. Okay. Can somebody help us out by sharing the slides? He has dropped it on the WhatsApp. Hello, Doctor Chan. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um. I want to commend the presenter. It was a very beautiful presentation, quite lucid and educative. Um, I just, I don't know if I missed it, but um, I have two questions actually. Number one is, have you heard of um, SAIMR um, anti-snake venom? As one. Two is um, SAIMR is South African Institute of uh, Medical Research. Then the second is, um, how can you use the 20 minute whole blood clot in time um, to monitor your treatment? Okay, I think those are my two questions. Thank you. Um, let me unmute myself. Okay, so for the SAM, SAIMR, I came across is a polyvalent um, anti venom. And um, it was what I know about it was that it causes um, severe anaphylaxis. So I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't include it here. Based, on, I, I came across it though, but it causes severe anaphylaxis, anaphylactic reactions. And then it's usually it's tailored around um, snakes that are commoner to um, South African region. I just chose more of those, and there are, there are a lot more anti um, anti snake venoms. I just chose those around our affecting our region, and then those I saw in our major um, textbook. I think that will include this. That's that what I know about it. Yeah, why well, I brought that out was because they are for different um, um anti snake venom. Okay. Okay. The one that we we're using before the ectaps came around. And okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Important not to forget, especially when you came that way. To okay. mention that kind of to only have all problems. Okay. Okay. So um, then the second question using the um, bedside the clotting, the 20 minutes blood clotting time. So after it, it should be done at a presentation, then every four to six hours. Now, after the um, venom, after I'm um, giving the anti snake venom, following one to two hours of um, administration, you want to repeat it again. Now, if after repeating the anti snake, after repeating the crude clotting time and it is normal, two hours after, at least at least two hours after administering your last dose of the anti snake venom, whether it's an add on dose, the patient may be deemed um, fit at that time to be discharged following, as in, it may, it may, it may, I'm sorry, it may show, it may just explain that the patient's, um, the anti venom, the envenomation is, um, is, subsiding or is abating so two hours after your last dose of uh, anti-venom administration you repeat the clot and um, bedside crude clotting time and assess to know if the patient will require further um, administration of the anti-venom that's what i saw so if it's still during two if it's still deranged, you give an add-on dose of the of the um, anti snake venom or repeat the um anti the the um administration of the anti snake venom, and then assess if the patient will benefit from further um blood products. Those are the two things. Okay. That's okay. We can go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ibiri. Thank you very much for your presentation. So move on to Dr. Ojo. Can you go ahead? Yes. Um, good morning, my my teachers, senior colleagues, and colleagues. My name is Dr. Akin Miyuji, and I'll be uh, talking about the WACP question 2021, 20, question 1A. The question with a middle-aged man presented to where and he with history of fever of three days, and chest pain ran to the jaw and showed that he was diaphoretic. Blood pressure was 150 over 90, mental mercury. He also had history of long distance travel. 
A, give five differentials and state your reasons. B, character component was elevated, count number values. What is your most likely diagnosis? C, you handed an ECG to state five abnormalities on, and to tie your ECG findings with the history to make a diagnosis. There was segment elevation, but it wasn't STEMI. Widespread STS division that were having saddle shift in B2 to B5, query acid depression area, query heart block. What is your final diagnosis? D, what are the factors that determine the management of this patient? E, you under the repeat ECG with the resolution of ST elevations. State five things you can see on the ECG. Then help, how will you manage this patient? Next slide, please. Now, looking at the uh, look, looking at the question, the uh, differential I came out with is uh, one, acute pericarditis. That is because of history of the fever before the onset of the chest pain. Most of the time, acute pericarditis is actually um, operatory tract infections with fever, uh, running nose, sore throat before the onset of the chest pain. And because of this, it shows diffuse segment division. And also because of the resolution of the ST segment division uh, after some time. Without the question telling us that there's a uh, place of Q waves. Then also because of the fact that there's no risk factors for arteriosclerosis in this patient, though we know that blood pressure was a little bit elevated, but we're not giving if this patient is known hypertensive or diabetic or history of smoking or history of angina. Then uh, uh, other differential could include that myocardial infarction because of the chest pain, though we know that uh, in, in MI fever would occur, but it's not really key uh, and it doesn't precede the onset of the uh, of the chest pain. In myocardial infarction. Also, other things that could support in mind the, uh, in the question is the stroke diaphoresis. The blood pressure was elevated at review, but as I said, we are not sure if this patient is immune hypertensive, and also the STM elevation on the ECG. And the presence of heart block, because we know that the, the MI that affect the, the right sided, especially the right coronary artery, because we know that right coronary artery is the one that supplies the SA node. So most of the time, uh, MI that affect the SA node tends to present uh, uh, with ad block of conduction abnormalities and also because of the uh, troponin elevation. I also thought of acute pulmonary embolism because of the history of the chest pain, because of the history of the long distance travel, and also because of the elevated uh, troponin. Malcadas could also be a differential because of the history of fever and also because of the uh, elevated troponin. Uh, COVID too, because I figured that the, que the question was said during the COVID era, and we know that COVID could present with fever and could have chest pain, but we're not giving all that there is uh, symptoms of uh, of COVID in the question like uh, sore throat or anosmia. And also, I also thought of Takosu, myocardial myopathy, of the chest pain, but we're not giving uh, history of uh, this event being preceded by stress or emotional instability. So the, my most likely differential I'm going with is the acute pericarditis uh, in this patient. Then talking about acute pericarditis, the ECG features, uh, I put this ECG to talk about the changes in acute uh, pericarditis and, and to differentiate it from that of an MI. Because most of the time, even in clinical practice, uh, a lot of times we want to differentiate between uh, pericarditis and MI because both of them actually come with the uh, chest pain as acute onset. And their referral of pain is also very similar to the jaw, or the left jaw. And so differentiating is very, very key because both of them have different uh, prognosis, have different uh, treatment modalities, and so differentiation is very important in clinical practice. So talking about pericarditis, we see that we see a concave shaped widespread ST elevation. Concave shaped widespread elevation, we can show the PCG. It, don't, it, 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 wasn't localized, it won't be localized to a particular territory as we have in MI. MI will most of the time be localized to a particular territory, either we're talking about in the anterior, Talking about uh, septa or lateral but in, in pericarditis, it will be widespread, it will be concave shaped. Other thing that I also uh, look out for in the ECG is when we start seeing PL depression. PL depression is very uh, very key in pericarditis. That way the arrow is pointing to us. And it occurs at the same time with Meso. the Meso. Hello, sorry, anything? Can I continue? Yeah, continue. Ah, all right. So, we are doing a very key in, uh, in pericarditis because it's, it's the most common uh, common thing I find. Don't worry. Don't worry. All the things are washed, though. From, you know, from I have a cleaner. And the widespread STD segment revision. Thursday. 
Yeah, it's so and, and it is not localized a particular uh, territory on the ECG. Next slide, please. This is another slide that shows uh, uh, pericarditis. You can see you can see this from V2 to V3 to V4 to V5. We can see the white perivation involving one, two, uh, AVL. And by the time we look at uh, or, uh, AVR, because we know that is a negative lead, instead of seeing the PR, uh, PR depression, we see some PR elevation in that place. So this kind of particular uh, finding uh, point towards more pericarditis as opposed to uh, myocardial infarction. Next slide, please. Yeah, it is just, uh, I just put this table to just still differentiate, talk about the diffuse concave shape in pericarditis, whereas in ischemia is localized and it's uh, uh, convex. PR depression, as I mentioned, is very frequent in pericarditis. Q waves. Uh, in the in the evolution of the uh, ST segment in uh, MI, key waves start to appear even with treatment. But we don't have key waves in pericarditis. Also, T waves uh, uh, infarction is actually it's there even when the ST segment is still there in, in, in MI. But in pericarditis, we know that before the T wave infarction will happen, the S segment will have will have resolved. And it's rhythm is also very common in, uh, in uh, MI, as I've explained. And convulsion abnormality is very common, as I've explained in the next slide, please. So uh, also, because I also put uh, P as also one of my differential, I also put this table to also talk about the chest pain in uh, MI, in P, and also in pericarditis. Both of them, most of them are to stand up and sudden onset, onset. But what differentiates is that uh, the radiation is also similar. But uh, we know that most of the time in pericarditis, the pain tends to be positional, tends, uh, tends to uh, relief, some patient lean forward, tends to be pleuritic as opposed to what happens in MI and, uh, and uh, pulmonary embolism. Then also the response to nitroglycine is also key because a patient with MI, when we give them nitroglycine spray, their pain tends to improve. I uh, don't have that in P or pericarditis. Also, uh, pericardial friction rub, which is a traffic sound that we hear in patients with pericarditis, is not present in MI and pulmonary, and pulmonary embolism. Next slide, please. Yes, so the, the other question, the other segment is going was talking about these changes that we can see in uh, the my diagnosis, which is the, the pericarditis. So the stage one composed of the, as I said earlier, S segment elevation, except in AVR and, and V1. What is uh, important about them is that they are concave, they are widespread. So uh, they are saddle shaped, uh, ECG changes. So after some time, you now see the resolution of the S segment and uh, before I, before that, the PR segment uh, depression actually happens at the same time with the segment elevation. Then, and we have a segment uh, resolution. Then, before now, see the evaporation of uh, uh, T waves in stage three and in stage four, now see the normalization of the T waves. Those are the uh, stages of these changes in the pericarditis. Next slide, please. Yes, this is uh, talking. The next question is talking about what we will determine how we manage. Most of the time, for patients present with acute pericarditis, which it is not uh, complicated with any other thing, the treatment usually is usually a benign condition. Most of the time, it may not need uh, hospital admission. But when we see some other things associated with uh, this pericarditis, uh, as I listed here, when the temperature is very high, more than 38, when there is subacute cause, when there is large pericardial effusion, when you have tried NSAIDs and uh, NSAID is not successful in patient immunosuppression or malpericarditis, these are the ones that we may need uh, hospital admission. So these are the things that we'll check out for to decide where we want to manage this patient. We want to manage it as an outpatient basis or we want to uh, man, uh, uh, do hospital admission. So hospital, uh, from the guideline, we see that hospital admission is uh, recommended for high risk patient with acute pericarditis, at least one of those listed uh, risk factors. Whereas well, for those that are low risk, we usually do uh, outpatient uh, treatment. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned this. I've mentioned this previous. Next slide. So the the management the management involves um, history taking taking um, history that may point to the diagnosis and the history that is important is true of uh, severe resistance up. Precordial chest pain that often refer to the neck, the hands, or the left shoulder. As I mentioned earlier, the pain is pleuritic, and most of the time, the, the pain is better by patient leaning uh, forward. And uh, risk factors 
uh, will be sought out for in the history, like fever, recent uh, upper respiratory tract infection, history of rehydration, uh, history of uh, CKD, uremia, or history of uh, medication that can cause autoimmune uh, pericarditis. So that's technical illness like SLE, rheumatoid arthritis can also cause uh, uh, pericarditis and also history of uh, trauma. Other symptoms include dyspnea, cough, and uh, fever, as we have in our index patient. On examination, I want to uh, I've talked about the pericardial fusion rub with a triphatic sound, and it's actually part of the that when, when we hear it in patients with pericarditis, though it's seen in only like a third of cases. I said, uh, it's likened to a sound that we hear when you walk on the country uh, snow, and it's uh, heard best in the lower uh, left side of the with patient leaning forward. Next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, new stigma elevation and uh, pericardial effusion, other new or worsening. Additional thing that I want to do, want to check for uh, biomarkers of inflammation, C-reactive protein, ESR, and also in patients that have chronic pericarditis, in which, or when we think of complicated pericarditis, we want to start uh, uh, considering doing a CT or cardiac MRI. Next time, please. Okay, so this is the recommendation. Yes, you can recommendation for uh, pericarditis. This is recommended for all patients with suspect pericarditis. As we say, 1C, class 1C recommendation. Uh, echocardiography is also recommended class 1C, and it's very important to rule out pericardial effusion. And also, uh, uh, this CG, the echo itself is mainly to rule out pericardial effusion because most of the time, the inflammation and the, 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 the well, diabetes actually clinch on uh, cardiac uh, MRI. But the echo is very important to roll out uh, pericardial effusion and to also, if it's efficient, it's large enough, want to collect samples to send for investigations so that we're able to also know the actual cause of the, of the pericarditis. Yes, I say, it's also recommended for all patients with suspected pericarditis and also inflammatory markers, as I mentioned earlier, like CRP and uh, cardiac troponin is recommended in patients with uh, suspected pericarditis. Next slide, please. Okay, test x rays to uh, uh, findings usually normal, but you know, complicated. But you can also see uh, uh, peripheral effusion, which the, the heart will look globular and water bottle shaped. I have a, a picture that shows that echo is usually normal, as I've said, but it's usually obtained to detect an effusion. And so, and if the effusion is large enough, you want to uh, get samples to send for investigation to know the uh, exact cause of the pericarditis. In difficult cases, CT. Or color camera can be helpful in detecting pericardial uh, thickening. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, this is the picture I was talking about. We can see that this is a, a globular heart uh, on X ray. So when we see this in its setting of uh, patient heart fever, or cough, or dyspnea, and or features of uh, pericarditis, that may be a sign that this patient has pericardial effusion. So this is a classical thing that we see in patient has pericardial effusion. Next slide, please. Yes, in terms of, in terms of treatment, uh, NSAIDs is actually a uh, first line and it's uh, beneficial, it has excellent profile. And uh, most of the time, we usually use very high doses, uh, like ibuprofen, 20 milligrams uh, three times a day. We can also use uh, acetic acid as aspirin, but in very high doses, not the one we give for uh, stroke prevention. Uh, two to four grams daily in divided doses uh, is an alternative. But uh, in, because we are using very high dose of N6, we the recommendation that we should cover with the protocol pump uh, inhibitor to prevent uh, gastric uh, ulcer. Then cocaine is also very important and uh, improves initial response when you're using conjunction with N6 and reduce the chance of recurrence. This, the drugs exert its anti-inflammatory effect by blocking the microtubule assembly in the white blood cells. And it's uh, important to give for a long term to prevent uh, recurrent. This just to uh, also uh, reinforce our cell with the recommendation. Aspirin or NSAIDs are recommended as first line therapy for acute pericarditis with gastropotension. So that's a class one uh, a recommendation. Also, coxine is, a recommended, is recommended as first line therapy for acute pericarditis as an adjunct to either aspirin or NSAIDs. It's also a class one. Uh, recommendation. We talked about CRP importance already. It's very important 
to make our diagnosis because of course it's an inflammatory process we expect therapy to be elevated and also important to also monitor uh, treatment as we are treating we expect our therapy to start uh, uh, dropping so it's also useful as and uh, very important to monitor uh, treatment low dose steroids is very important but they are not used at first line they are used when you have used your insects and your insects is not working and you want to bring in uh, uh, low dose uh, corticosteroids. steroids that will make it a two-way uh, recommendation next slide please so just a little things on pericardite. I've mentioned a lot of things. I've just jumped on. I've mentioned. Okay, Doctor Ojo, please. Um, yeah, just give us salient points. Sorry, okay. uh, Doctor Atta, I I have to um interrupt also. Um, Doctor Ojo, I'm wondering, have you finished answering the questions? Yes. But yes, there's a question that said, what factors uh determine your treatment also? Okay. Yes, ma I, 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 if there is, if it is straightforward pericarditis with no complication, we can manage as uh, an outpatient. But when there are complications, there was there was a slide I uh, put when the uh, high temperature, when the patient is not responding to initial insights, when there is other complications. Yes, this one that we may need That's to manage as a. Yeah. yeah, actually, if you look at the question, I don't believe uh, this question is tilted towards uh, pericarditis. Um, okay. I thought this question is more of myocardial infarction. If you look at the um, scenario given, an elderly patient coming with uh, hypertensive rage, uh, blood pressure. But I thought the participants should have commented, will, will have comments on this. Yeah, uh, BP is in the hypertensive okay. range. Cardiac troponins elevated, pain radiating to the jaw also. I think this is more of a typical presentation of MI rather than um, pericarditis. So um, even though the factors they were talking of, if you look at, is more of a myocardial infection. But I, I doubt I doubt if this is um, actually uh, pericarditis. But I don't know. Maybe other colleagues will comment. So, oh. and the way you, you give the presentation, it's, it's not possible to give all this in the exams. I thought you would just give us uh, the PowerPoint answers. You just give the answers when you go to the discussion because I was wondering whether you are answering the question or you were giving discussion. It was too lengthy. Um, I thought the first part of the presentation should be just answers, one, two, three. You give straightforward answers after which you go to the discussion. I don't think it's possible to take all the, the uh, to repeat what you have done, actually. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Ma. I, I don't know. If, can I can I respond? Can I say something? Yes, please. All right. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. I, when, when looking at the question, yes, I look at the question. That's why I, I sec, my second differential is actually myocardial infarction. But the though maybe there's an uh, issue with recall, and uh, maybe that uh, issue we to recall, but we look at the question properly. They, they give history of fever of three days, chest pain, yes, blood pressure is up, then long distance travel. Now, the, 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 there was no uh, mention of risk factors for him and this patient, maybe like hypertension or previous issue of angina. Nothing was made mention of that. Though the blood pressure at present was, was 150 90, but we're not giving uh, any any pointer to the fact that the patient is not hypertensive. And also the, the fact that the. Dr. Dough, Ojo, like, Dr. Ojo, sorry. So chest pain radiating to the jaw and shoulder is typical of pericarditis. Also with diaphoresis, also with high BP. Please, I think. <laughs> Please don't change the mind of others. Let other people comment, please. I think you don't have to repeat all, all you have said. Let's hear other people's uh, opinion, please. Dr. Sussex okay. won't do it. Yeah, Dr. Sussex. Sorry, Dr. Sussex, before you talk. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Yeah, so yes, we can hear you, sir. OK. So, um, please, Joe, sometimes the questions come in a way to make you, because the first question might be, what are your differential? So they paint the picture, many differential there. You understand? We we'll add certain things 
fast travel so that can create um um trauma embolism in your differentials. So that's why they give those kind of information, all right? So that you can have wide range of differential diagnosis to talk about. So, but subsequent questions can now help you narrow down to your diagnosis. You understand? So, um, at maybe it's just the ECG actually that will make you arrive at your diagnosis. Unfortunately, we don't have the ECG in the exam. Okay. So, yes, from all the information you are giving, you can think of um, pericarditis. But MI is also possible, pulmonary tumor embolism is also possible based on all the all the questions. So at the end of the day, it might have just been the um ECG that will be the clincher to the diagnosis, and we don't have the ECG. Okay, so um with that in mind, uh you, the point is you just have to have an open mind. It's possible that right, it's also possible that what the picture they are trying to paint is that of an MI. Okay, but they just give the added information so that you can have a lot of differential diagnosis. So I just wanted to chip that in before we continue so that I don't be any need to be arguing too much. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Success, you want to say something? Okay, good morning, senior colleagues and colleagues on our teacher. Um, thank you, presenter. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I, uh, Dr. Fatima, Ma, well, I, I think that the even if we are talking about differential diagnosis, we have a most likely diagnosis to manage. And I think the most likely diagnosis here is MI. Um, the presenter, please, I was looking at something, and I know that even in the ST segment elevation, they are, they are wearing saddle shaped. Okay, they were not that so that we are not um saddle shaped in V2 to V5. So most likely, I think there's a hard lock, then there's um ST segment elevation. Now, including the you know, clinical presentation of diaphoresis, chest pain radiating to the jaw, back, you know. And so I think that the most likely diagnosis, although I was expecting the cardiologist to which I know they will also make their input, because we are supposed to manage the likely diagnosis. So I think it's important we actually know what the, unfortunately too, just like Chief has said, Chief Regimentals have said, we don't have the ECG. Or maybe I think we can look for a similar ECG so that we can manage the most likely diagnosis, which I think is MID. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Ata. Right, thank you. Yes. Dr. Ata, let's not dwell yes. on this. Dr. Fatima is a cardiologist. There's yeah. something I know about being a specialist. There are things to hear, there are things to see. Even without even going to the end of the question, you already know the diagnosis. She's a cardiologist. She has said that um, from what she can see from the question, that is more of an MI. I think we should listen to her. She's a field. The specialist, she has passed her fellowship exam. So... I think we should pay attention to what she's saying and listen to the tips and the tips. Another thing she has seen, saying that in case you see something like this in the exam, you know, I see the presenter didn't did do well, did do excellently well. But the essence of these classes for people in that field, people that have gone for the same exam, to tell you, oh, look at this. So this is what is making me think of MI. This is what is making the examiners think of this like that. So when the specialists and people that have gone for these exams are speaking, I think we should pay attention to them and do not argue. What you can do is ask, ah, Mao, I felt to, so that's okay. Even though you felt, but look at this one, look at this one, look at this one. So please, let's, um, let's not dwell too much on this matter. Dr. Fatima is an authority on this matter. So we should just listen to what she has to say. If there's anything we miss, let her guide us. Okay, this is it, this is it, this is it. How would you differentiate? So I expect more participants to be asking, okay, how would you differentiate it in the exam? Between MI, what do we see? I will know it's pure MI. What do we see? I will know it's pure pericarditis. So please, you ask more questions like that and not 
just say, mm-mm, you know? Then she's a specialist, so it's not easy to be a specialist. That's just my take on this matter. So please, but I can continue. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Ma. So um, we are, we are uh, is there, uh, we are also open to con more contributions, okay, um, from the chat box, okay, Dr. Ekele is also thinking, yes, it's MI2, because they say the ST elevations were not saddle shaped. Um, um, Dr. Esther was asking what's happening on the right side of the, okay, the X-ray showed, the globular heart X-ray showed. Um, Dr. Paul is saying first differential should be MI. Uh, Dr. Faye also, okay, she, she feels it might be pericarditis showing another ECG is now a resolution. Okay, Dr. Sanimu is saying this is MI Chica. I think you should have an open mind. Okay, the presenter may be right because of VNET says the ST elevation were widespread and yet it was not ST, ST, uh, STMI. So what do we make of this please? Okay, I think um, Dr. Fatima, you know, addressed uh, this. And Dr. Success also mentioned that those ST elevations are not saddle shaped. So, okay. Um, do you have any other contribution? Um, any other? I know we've managed MI before now. I don't know. Um, uh, in one of the questions we treated. But um, Dr. Ojo probably will add uh, management of MI to this um, to his slide, Dr. Ojo. Okay, thank you very much. I... And then uh, I'll do Ojo. that. I'll do that. So, Dr. Ruka, I say thank you, Dr. Ojo, for the effort. Still help us with the slides. Okay, it can serve as a revision for archipelagitis. Perhaps the question can be removed so, so from the slides to avoid. Uh, Okay, can be removed. So from the slice to avoid the confusion, but it's good slice on acute pericarditis. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Momori is asking, could dresser syndrome be a differential? Okay, Dr. Fatima wants to say something. I don't know. Let's let Dr. Fatima comment. You have still can go ahead. Yeah. Um, so regarding the ST elevation that they said it was widespread, why is ST elevation may be widespread if a patient presents with an extensive myocardial infarction involving uh, several uh, segments of the heart. So um, being widespread doesn't mean, uh, th that doesn't rule out uh, uh, MI. If it's an extensive, the ST elevation might be widespread. Then uh, regarding the factors to determine management of the patient, um, one of the factors include a timing of present time of presentation. If a patient presents within the golden hours, then that tells you that you can um, take the patient immediately to the cath lab for revascularization. Um, of course, if the patient presents outside the golden hours, depending on the presentation, if the patient still have persistent uh, chest pain, um, worsening um, ECG changes, then that can also determine your um, management of the patient. So also a patient coming with complications like cardiogenic shock, patients coming with uh, arrhythmias, heart block, um, uh, and all that, or even a patient coming in cardio, uh, yeah, cardiogenic shock, I said. So that will also uh, determine what you, will, uh, what you will do for the patient. That will also determine the line of management. Then again, availability of facilities for PCI will also determine your management. For instance, um, in most of our hospitals, we don't have facilities for PCI. So if a patient presents within the, even if a patient presents within the golden hours, you, you don't have cath lab. So what all you can do is uh, thrombolysis. If the patient comes with uh, SC elevation, MI, as in this case, but if you have facilities and the patient is coming uh, uh, within the uh, golden hours, then you can immediately take that patient for revascularization. So this, uh, some of the answers regarding the question on factors that will determine management of the case. So thank you. Okay, I think we've lost her. Uh, okay, maybe network. Okay, um, that's, uh, yeah. 
Yes. I can allow the participant, Dr. Ojo, attend the dress last question. He can do it. Yes. He, yes. Yes. he prepared for this presentation, so I know he can handle it. Yes. So if yes. Dr. Fatima or any of the cardiologists need to add one or two things, yes. fine. But I think Dr. Ojo can handle it. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, talking about dress dance syndrome, uh, another to note in MI and pericarditis is that uh, pericarditis can be a complication of uh, MI. And the pericarditis of MI can be in two types. It can be acute, uh, the one that occurs about three days after treatment. And it can be the one that occurs after 10, uh, about 10 days after treatment of uh, MI, which is the Dressler syndrome. That one is actually an autoimmune reaction eh? well, as a result of the, of the uh, myocardial necrosis. So Dressler syndrome is actually um, a delayed type of uh, apostatic reaction, uh, pericarditis, that of course follow the myocardial infarction. Thank you. So in this in this setting now, if the question were to be Tesla, so the 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 typical presentation would be that the MI uh, features will come first. They're doing the course of the presentation, maybe like ten days after you now start seeing something like fever, uh, knee onset chest pain, and uh, difficulty in breathing. So that may be more in keeping. Uh, with this stuff, if the question is maintained in that direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ojo, for that. Um, okay, Dr. Momoda also is saying that uh, differentiating acute pericarditis from acute myocardial infarction is the absence of Q waves and the absence of T wave inversion at, this, at the time of ST, ele ST segment elevation, so both of which classically occur with acute myocardial infarction. Um, Dr. Nwata, the acupuncturist studies have suggested that at least two of the following four criteria should be present. I think he mentioned it on one of his tables. Uh, characteristic chest pain, pericardial friction rub, suggestive ECG changes, new or worsening pericardial infusion. I think he had um, a picture there, the table there, depicting these criteria. Okay. And then Dr. Mosakwe said Dressler syndrome could occur up to six weeks post MI. So we'll also take note of that. Um, I don't know if Dr. Fatima is back. She had not made all the points she wanted to make. Hello? Uh, yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't know um, my network was that bad. Um, I was uh, mentioning factors that will determine management of the patient. Um, did you hear that? Yes, you were mentioning the, the revascularization, if there's a cat lab and if there are no cat lab, you need to uh, do um, thrombolysis. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, I said if a patient comes with complication like a eugenic shock or heart failure or arrhythmia, that would also determine all that you will do for the patient and the timing of presentation, availability of uh, facilities for revascularization. I think that's um, all I would mention about that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Oh, sorry for the contribution. So um, any other contribution, any clarifications? because our time is fast spent before I hand over to Dr. Christopher and our teachers. Any? Okay. So I'll hand over to Dr. Christopher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Tata. I must appreciate Dr. Um, Dr. Ojo. Thank you so much. It was quite a lucid presentation. In a way, it's a good thing in he spoke on pericarditis. I remember when we answered this question when I was going for an exam, it was actually an MI we managed. So I think we answered it like two, three times, all the time, so it was MI we managed. But I love the way we went to pericarditis, just in case our dear people 